Hey, Ramon. Ramon, I'm everyone.
I don't think so. Yeah, it, like Joe just called change.
one, two, one, two, test tech, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. You see me? You hear me? One, two, three, four, five. Checking, testing, one, two, three, four, five. Oh wow. Like a five minute delay. <sighs> Check one, two, three, four, five. Hey, hey, one, two, three, four, five. Checking, testing, one, two, three, four, five. Hey, hey, one, two, three, four, five. This is lavalier number two. I am checking lavalier number two. One, two, three, four, five. Checking, testing, lavalier number two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Checking and testing. Welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. We're going to have a lecture here at the Penn Auditorium tonight. And we, yeah, huh? Penn, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm talking right now. I'm, I'm saying something about being at the Penn Auditorium. Welcome to.
let me out when I have to. That's totally fine. I will too. We'll let each other out. Been to where? Yeah.
No, not the same thing. I'm just looking at what his camera look like. Okay.
Good evening. Whoa. <laughs> oh boy, just, just wait. <laughs> uh, my name is Dorothy Roberts, and I'm the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mazel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights here at Penn. And <laughs> And I'm also on the faculty of the Africana Studies Department. Now, before we get started, I'd like to ask that you please silence your cell phones. Thank you. And now to our much anticipated program. On behalf of the Center for Africana Studies, along with the law school, welcome. Welcome to the Honorable A. Leon Higginbotham Junior Memorial Lecture featuring ta Coates in conversation with Camille Charles, Director of the Center for Africana Studies. This program is part of Mr. Coates' exclusive tour to celebrate the publication of his latest book, We Were Eight Years in Power, An American Tragedy, a collection of his essays about the Obama era. We're delighted that he generously agreed to combine this stop on this book tour with our annual program that honors the life and legacy of Judge Leon Higginbotham. Presented during the fall semester each year, the Higginbotham Lecture focuses on a topic, event, or personality in the African American community of either historical or contemporary significance in areas of history, law, sociology, or social justice. Others will say more about the lecture, about Judge Higginbotham, and about Mr. Coates, but I want to reflect briefly on the urgency and timeliness of this particular program for the current state of racial politics in America. Just on Monday, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly praised Confederate General Robert E. Lee as, quote, an honorable man, and said that, quote, the lack of the ability to compromise led to the Civil War, suggesting that the nation should have compromised over slavery even more than it had since its founding. In my opinion, the best response came swiftly and brilliantly from ta Coates in a Twitter thread that began at 5 a.m. yesterday morning. <laughs> <laughs> In a series of rapid fire tweets, Mr. Coates completely eviscerated Kelly's creationist theorizing on Lee and the Civil War, as he called it, with fact after historical fact. When I read it, I thought, wow, am I glad we had the foresight to invite ta Coates <laughs> for this particular time right now. 
Speaking for the Center for Africana Studies, we want to thank our co-host Penn Law and Dean Ted Ruger for his partnership and generous support for this lecture and conversation. Thanks also to our wonderful co-sponsors, the Annenberg School for Communication and Dean Michael Deli Carpini, the School of Social Policy and Practice and Dean John Jackson, the Graduate School of Education and Dean Pam Grossman, the African American Resource Center directed by Valerie Dorsey Allen, and the Black Alumni Society whose national president is April Clater. The program would not be possible without your support. And now I want to introduce my colleague from Penn Law and the university's provost, Wendell Pritchett, who will speak on behalf of the university administration. Provost Pritchett, Penn's chief academic officer, is also a presidential professor in the law school and the graduate school of education. Provost Pritchett's scholarly work focuses on urban history and policy with an emphasis on housing, race relations, and economic development. He has served as Chancellor of Rutgers University Camden and as Interim Dean of Penn Law School. His many civic engagements include serving as Deputy Chief of Staff and Director of Policy for the City of Philadelphia and as a member of the Philadelphia School Reform Commission. Please join me in welcoming Provost Pritchett. Thanks. Thank you, Dorothy. Wow, it's great to see this hall really filled and for such an important event, and I'm really happy to see you all here. On Penn's behalf, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2017 Higginbotham Lecture, as you know, featuring a discussion with Tanisi Coates. In the past, Penn has hosted remarkable journalists, best-selling authors, incisive cultural critics, and comic book scribes. But I don't think they've ever actually been the same person. <laughs> so we're honored that Mr. Coates is with us tonight, and he and Professor Camille Charles will be up in just a few minutes. But before we begin the, form, begin the formal program, uh, I'd like to share two brief stories uh, about the great Leon Higginbotham Jr. that I believe are relevant and I hope will resonate this evening. So Judge Higginbotham Jr. was a towering figure of jurisprudence and not just because he stood at six foot five. He was the first African-American judge on the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. He was also the first black lawyer to argue on behalf of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the courts of common pleas and later in the Pennsylvania Superior Court. He was also a prominent civil rights leader, an activist, an author, and a thought leader, and a scholar. He was never a student here, but he lived in West Philadelphia. Actually, I lived down the street from him. Um, and Penn was Judge Higginbotham's adopted university. He was a professor of sociology and law, a trustee, an overseer of the law and education schools, and a mentor, advisor, confidant, and friend to generations of students, faculty, and staff. I include myself in that group. I had the honor of getting to know him and work with him for many years. He was an amazing person. His views on race, justice, and injustice were informed by two pivotal events, events in his life. So Higginbotham attended a segregated high school in Trenton, New Jersey. After graduating, he enrolled at Purdue University in 1944 at age 16. He intended to become an engineer. At that time, the student body at Purdue was composed of 6,012 students, 6,012 students. 6,000 were white and 12 were black, including Higginbotham. The students lived in dorms. The white students lived in dorms. The black students housed in the only building in West Lafayette, Indiana, where blacks were permitted to live, called International House. They slept in the attic, the unheated attic. As the days grew colder, Higginbotham approached the university's president to protest the students' living conditions. The law doesn't require us to put you in dormitories, the president stated. The law doesn't even require us to let you in. You take it or you leave it, he said. So Higginbotham left. He transferred to Antioch College. And after that meeting, he decided to study law, for things like reason I think you could see obvious. In the fall of 1949, he entered Yale Law School. That's the first story. The second story is one Judge Higginbotham shared with me and many of my colleagues when I was in law school uh, many years later. He had graduated with a law degree from Yale in 1952. He moved to Philadelphia in search of a job. He searched. 
He searched. He searched. And he searched with all of the city's top law firms. Weeks and then months went by. For a year, this graduate of one of the world's finest law schools was not offered a single job because he was black. Now, I relate those two incidents not to show how much things have changed since then. They have some. Or how much work there is yet to be done. There's goddamn plenty. Instead, before we begin our conversation, I want you to consider how incidents of injustice, racial or otherwise, can change the course of a life, your life, a friend's life, or the life of a stranger. Injustice may be laws that are immoral. Injustice may be inequality of access, opportunity, or treatment. It may be a frigid attic room in Indiana. Or it may be a law partner who sees across the desk not the degree from Yale, but the degree of pigmentation in the African skin, right here in Philadelphia. Injustice may be degradation or humiliation. In Judge Higginbotham's case, it was also motivation, and that is why we honor him this evening. Let me close with one final thought. No place, no city, no university campus is immune from injustice, nor can we escape our past. Universities in particular, yes, including this one, have, have complicated histories. As provost of this great university and as a black provost, you might have noticed, <laughs> I am proud to say that Penn holds a very special pride of place among the world's top schools. If you are accepted here and you choose to come, there is a place for you here. Even if you cannot afford to pay, there is a place for you here. We make great strides in our quest for diversity in all forms because we believe that institutions cannot hope to serve the world unless they reflect the world. Higher education cannot and should not be held to any standard less than absolute, absolute equality of opportunity, access, and treatment. That is just and that is right. Is there more work to do? Yeah, there's a lot of work to do and we continue to do it. You filled this room to its historic rafters not because you believe this work or this evening's conversation will be easy, but because you know it will be difficult. But it's the difficult discussions that push us to confront injustice, past and present, and to pursue a world where cold addicts and cold hearts are left to history. I think Mr. Coates would agree, and I know Judge Higginbotham would. So on behalf of Penn, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a member of this community. And now it's my great pleasure to invite my friend, Ted Ruger, Dean of the Law School, to say a few words. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Wendell. Uh, good evening to you all. It's my great pleasure to join my colleagues from across the university today uh, to welcome you here for the Honorable Liam Higginbotham uh, Lecture for 2017. I do promise you that I'm the last in the line of introducers. Um, <laughs> Uh, on behalf of Penn Law School, um, with our deep history with Judge Higginbotham, we're very pleased to, to welcome uh, tonight's esteemed speaker, ta Coates, who will be in conversation uh, with Professor Camille Charles. Um, Professor Pitchett, uh, Provost Pritchett, spoke eloquently about uh, Judge Higginbotham's pioneering role um, in the legal system in Philadelphia and in the nation. I will add only a few words to his and to Professor Roberts. Um, first, about this lecture established in 1989. The lecture recognizes Judge Higginbotham's contributions to the American legal and scholarly communities um, by bringing in a, a leading scholar, author, public service to campus whose work focuses on issues, events, um, and uh, the history of the African-American community in the area of history, social justice, and law, and certainly in Mr. Coates, we have somebody who speaks to, to all of those tonight. Um, second, about the judge's long and distinguished career, which Provost Pritchett spoke to. Um, it culminated in President Bill Clinton awarding him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1995. Um, I would emphasize uh, Judge Higginbotham, who sat on the federal bench for 29 years, his deep connection to the University of Pennsylvania and to Penn Law School during that time. He had a 30-year 30, 30 relationship with the university, serving as a member of our board of overseers at the law school, um, chairman of that board, uh, as well as uh, on the boards of Graduate School of Education. He taught at the law school for, for many decades, um, and we're very much in his debt and very proud of his Penn affiliation. Finally, as a law dean, I want to emphasize a part of the judge's biography, which is sometimes obscured given that he was such a pioneer in so many public roles. He was also a tremendous legal scholar, the author of dozens of articles and books. Uh, like our speaker tonight, he was an astute observer of the nation's long history of racial inequality. 
um, and the ways in which that inequality manifests even today in our legal structures and in our legal system. Um, so I want to quote from a 1992 article that the judge wrote about uh, Virginia's antebellum slavery codes and very punitive legal system. He connected and concluded by connecting it to the justice system of our present day saying, most thoughtful scholars recognize the extraordinary interrelationship between the centuries of oppression that both slaves and free blacks endured during the colonial and antebellum periods and today's racial balance sheet in America. In short, some aspects of the legacy of our past still live on and still haunt us. It's this notion of remembering history and the haunting nature of that history in a country that purports to strive for justice that is very much core to the work of our speaker tonight. And we are so happy that to welcome him, continuing very much in the, the vein of Judge Higginbotham's writings and his own career. So to conclude, I'll with, two, with a too brief introduction, both for uh, Mr. Coates and Professor Charles. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates is a national correspondent for The Atlantic. His book, Between the World and Me, uh, won the National Book Award in 2015. He's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. Uh, he lives in New York with his wife and son. Uh, professor Camille Charles is the Walter H. and Lenore Annenberg Professor in the Social Sciences, Professor of Sociology, Africana Studies, and Education, and directs the Center for Africana Studies. She is the author of Won't You Be My Neighbor, Race, Class, and Residence in Los Angeles, and co-author of The Source of the River, The Social Origins of Freshmen at America's Selective Colleges and Universities, and Taming the River, Negotiating the Academic, Financial, and Social Currents in Selective Colleges and Universities. Please join me in welcoming um, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Professor Charles in conversation tonight. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, we're delighted to have you here this evening, Tanahisi. Um, just some ground rules. I'm going to ask some questions at the beginning for the first 40 minutes or so, and then we have time uh, for a very a short question and answer period at the end. Okay, so I'm going to get right into it because, as you can see, the graduate students were ambitious. Mm, mm. Um, so. Um, I think I want to start by asking like, a sort of loaded question about the origins of this particular book. Mm. Um, I think sort of who, what inspired you, um, and, and in particular, in thinking about that, what are the origins of the title? Wow, I hope you got time. That clock is ticking. <laughs> <laughs> and they just knocked two minutes off. I just looked and that said 40, it's a, it's and now okay. it says 38. It, I know people. <laughs> <laughs> Try to rush me off the stage all right. We'll be fine. <laughs> uh, and it's ticking. <laughs> um, so I had, uh, you know, I'd, I'd spent, I've been at the Atlantic almost 10 years now, and it was requested of me uh, by, by, you know, several people I would meet, well, why don't you put together all of your pieces in, in, into, you know, a book and publish some sort of best of or whatever. And, you know, I, I presented that idea to my editor, Chris, uh, Chris Jackson, tremendous, tremendous editor, and he said, yeah, let's do that. Um, and I signed a contract to do that. And when I started pulling it together, um, it just, I just think you have to understand about like writers, or at least myself as a writer, like I'm here talking to you right now. And I, and I love, you know, obviously talking to you know, people about, about my work, but Writing is primarily a, a private act. The, the presentation is, you know, the after effects of, of, of writing. And so when I'm pulling together a book, I, I like to feel, I want to feel, I need to feel excited about it anytime I'm doing something with writing. And when I started to pull together a best of, I just, it just felt old and dusty and I had already <laughs> done all of this and I had been here and it just felt like an assignment and it bored me. Um, but at the same time, when I went back and looked at some of those pieces, I thought, um, 
it might be interesting to try to share my reflections on them and try to, you know, not put everything I had written during that period in the book, but string uh, uh, a particular group of pieces together mm -hmm. into the book and, you know, try to make some sort of statement. Um, and once I had the pieces, once I read them together, it became clear to me that this was, you know, sort of, you know, my, my chronicling of the Obama years with Obama, sometimes central, sometimes off to the side, you know, mm -hmm. but always present, always um, exercising a, 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 a sense of gravity, you know, um, on the writing. And so that was the book. That was the book. And that was what I, you know, attempted to do. Okay. Um... Do you, do you have the sense and were you thinking at all about that eight year period and the way that your career kind of took off and the trajectory of your career um, and his, in a sense, or at least, you know, the presidency and- Well, he was a United States Senator, so, uh, <laughs> and I was in the unemployment line. <laughs> 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 One of those things is uh, different from the yes. other. <laughs> As they say, um, I, I what I had a sense of was at the point that I had started that book, I was um, receiving um, a great deal of praise and, and accolades, and it made me makes me uh, uncomfortable because um, like people name you and they and they tell you what what you are, and even when they're telling you things that are ostensibly good things, they dehumanize you in a way. I'll take just an example. I just want to be really, really clear about this, okay? Because um, like, sometimes this comes off as false humility, and it's not. Don't worry. I think I'm very talented. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't, don't think like this is like me, uh, you know, being insecure, but it's, it's a real thing. Um, 2015, I won the, um, the uh, MacArthur Fellowship, right? Which, for whatever reason, not in the, uh, you know, official naming of it is, you know, people refer to it as like the Genius Fellowship, right? People would say that. Like I was in a winner of the Genius Prize, people would say that. And to me, that obscured like the actual work of writing, which is difficult, which is painful. It's not enough to be smart. Um, it's not even close to enough to be smart to write something good. It, it requires a kind of endurance. It requires a kind of, you know, um, willingness to look at your own flaws. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I start any sort of piece I'm writing and it always starts off really, really, really bad. <laughs> I'm being real with you. And anybody in this audience that writes knows exactly what I'm talking about. It starts off really, really bad. And what separates writers from people who are not writers is writers have the ability to go back and look at their badness, revise, make it less bad, make it mediocre, make it kind of good, <laughs> and then make it publishable. <laughs> yes. But, but you see, that's not genius. That's not genius. You know, that's not, you know, that's not, uh, I just sit down and the ideas come to me and I type, ha ha, look how brilliant I am. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it just felt like, um, when, when I was working on the book and when I was trying to chart my own, I was trying to express like, like a, it was almost like a reclamation project for me of, of who I was, you know, and who, who, who I had been, you know, as, as a writer. Um, the title is very, very much annoyed me. It is like, um, you know, you see um, a black quarterback playing and the quarterback's playing really well. You say he's athletic, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, he is, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there's some other things going on that you ain't seeing, you know? Right. Um, and I felt like that, I don't want to be athletic. I don't want to be described as athletic, you know what I mean? So it was really a chance to kind of, you know, uh, describe myself for myself. Okay, great. So what, do you, what are your hopes for your writing? What do you want it to do when you push send and it goes out into the world. What are, what are your hopes? Um, well, I, I'm a very emotional writer. Um, I write with a, with, a, with a great deal of feeling. Um, I obviously, you know, try to do a tremendous amount of research and reporting to make sure those feelings are substantiated. But um, writing comes from a very, very emotional place um, for me. And I want to communicate that emotion to the reader, hopefully. That's what I'm trying to do. That's, that's what I hope to do. I mean, it's, you know, the first thing is for me, I, I want to feel good about what I'm doing. 
you know, I want it to thrill me. And my hope is that in thrilling me, it, it, will, it will thrill the reader. Thank you. You talk a lot about the ancestry of black literature, calling mm -hmm. it a long line of dream breakers. Mm -hmm. um, could you say a little bit more about what that means and, and what dream or dreams does your work try to break? Yeah, I mean, that goes back to Between the World and Me and this concept of the dream, you know, and this idea that um, th there's a kind of myth that the country tells itself about itself. You know, we, we saw that just yesterday in <laughs> some of the ridiculous comments about the Civil War. Um, I, I won't rehash that. I might a little bit. <laughs> I have a question here. About oh, okay. All right. We, yeah. Should I wait? Okay. You can. It's okay. next. All right. Um, <laughs> I asked a question, actually, oh. and I'll try to get those two together. Well, this question was really, why do, you, why do you, um, in, in your essay, Why Do So Few Blacks Study the Civil War, uh -huh. you, you basically answer your own question by yeah. saying the Civil War is a story for white people, acted uh -huh. out by white people on mm -hmm. white people's terms, in which blacks feature strictly as stock characters and props. Mm -hmm. Could you place that in the context yeah, of, of yesterday? Yeah, of course. Of course, I can. I can, and I can place it in the context of, uh, context of the previous okay. question. Um, wh white people in this country, um, people who believe that being white is really important to them, um, ha have a way of, of describing the world and a way of describing the country. Um, you saw that in the description, you know, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, by you know someone who works in. The, the highest offices of government. It's not a factual description. It's not, there's no science or any sort of, you know, um, anything or history or, you know, uh, uh, primary sources or scholarship behind it. it, it it's not about scholarship. Uh, the, the Civil War is, is, is the most obvious case of this. It's not hard to know what the Civil War is about. Like, there was, it's actually kind of hard. If, like, World War I, if you're trying to figure out what actually caused war, it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> you know, and historians have all sorts of arguments about it. 30 years war. What were they actually fighting about? Was it actually religion? You know, and historians go back and forth and they have. Mm -hmm. um, serious historians don't have arguments about what the Civil War was about. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason for that. <laughs> because the people who started the Civil War said why they were doing it. Right. <laughs> it, it was very clear. <laughs> You can Google, you know what I mean? Like right now, on your little iPhone, you know? Yeah. And you can Google, you know, uh, declarations and you know, articles of secession, and they'll tell you, you know what I mean? Mississippi will tell you, you know, we are thoroughly alive with the institution of African slavery. You know, very clear. South Carolina and their declaration, very, very clear. Vice President of the uh, Confederacy, very, 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 very clear. About what, I mean, the evidence is, is overwhelming. It is um, as if, Someone is, you know, looking at the sky, and it's blue. It's clearly blue. But now it's yellow. But when you want to run the world, you can tell everybody the sky is yellow. And you can make movies as though the sky was yellow. And you can write fiction as though the sky was yellow. And you can write whole, you know, histories, which are not actually histories, about how the sky is yellow. And you can be right next to the president of the United States or be president of the United States believing the sky is yellow. And African-American literature has always stood in opposition to that. It says the sky is blue. I don't care what you say, sky is blue. <laughs> sky is blue. And I insist on saying the sky is blue. And you can you know, delude yourself in, in any, any way you, know, you want. I can see the sky, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know what it is. And so as, as a writer, for me, you know, it's very, very important to you know, sort of stand in, in that tradition, to not be somebody who um, allays people, who makes it you know, more comfortable you know, for them to you know, live in myth. This guy told me today, he said, um, I was on Twitter, I tweeted out this, you know, things about how, how not to be more stupid, right? About how not to be stupid about the Civil War, because it is stupid. <laughs> like, how not to be stupid about the Civil War? John Kelly's being stupid. And, <laughs> and Trump is all, it's like, it's professionally stupid. <laughs> Just professional. <laughs> this is what he does. And I said, well, how dare you, you know what I mean? Don't you want to convince people? Why would you call them stupid? I said, I'm not going to make it, you know, I'm not going to make this easy for you. I'm not going to talk nice to you, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to talk to you like the world talked to me. 
You know, I'm going to be direct. I'm going to be you say something stupid, I'm going to tell you it's stupid. You know, I'm not going, you know, oh, you might not want to say that. Here's another way to think about it. You know, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. Nobody who loves me talks to me like that. You know, my wife don't talk to me like that. My <laughs> friends don't talk to me like that. You know, they're direct. You know, if I'm doing something serious, they tell me, that's stupid. You know, and so that's how I'm going to talk to folks. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, you know, cater or, you know, twist myself in any sort of way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll take a break from the civil war and we All might right. come back to it we right. might not um in in my president was black you say that president obama became a symbol of black people's everyday extraordinary americanness mm -hmm. uh and you have a wonderful essay about michelle obama called the american american girl right what is it about americanness for this particular black couple that makes them so important in and such a theme in your work uh, because i think like from the uh the perspective of uh, the integrationists um the notion is that black people actually fit quite well within the mores the traditions the culture the kind of quote unquote middle class bourgeois values that we talk about you know every day and white supremacy has long been um premised on the, on the denial of that mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. I, I just want to be clear. I mean, I'm, I'm not really a poster child for those values. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think there's serious questions to be raised about those values. I, you know, um, I'm just analyzing it as, as it is. So I don't want to take this as an endorsement, you know, that mm -hmm. idea that, you know, you should necessarily have to, you know, look like the first family looked in order to be accepted. You know, in this country, I certainly do not believe that. <clears throat> but having said that, the way the country works is it sets a standard you know, with all of the problems of gender and class and et cetera, that, you know, are embedded in that standard. And it says this group over here does not, you know, right. measure up. You know, they don't have family values. They don't, you know, care about their kids. They don't parent. You know, they're drug addicts. They're criminals. They're barbaric. They're savage, et cetera. And um, we have always had, you know, people who, you know, conducted themselves almost as if they were crafted to be walking refutations of that, of that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what the Obamas were. And I think like that, that is, you know, an often um, unremarked upon part A of their power and why I think folks were so threatening mm -hmm. by, threatened by them. You know, mm -hmm. there are uh, black people, you know, in America who I love, you know what I mean? Who I adore, you know, black popular figures, but they don't threaten in the same way. Right. You know what I mean? Right. We, like we have this idea that it's usually, you know, the thug that, uh, that threatens Right. You know, in fact, that's not true. No, that's what they think of you anyway. So, you know, I mean, there's no real right. threat there. Um, but you know, here you got these, you know, two black Ivy League trained lawyers. You know what I mean? With their, you know, two beautiful kids, and the grandmother lives with them. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, you know. <laughs> the dog named Bo. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> the dog named. Bo. <laughs> I mean, I halfway don't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but it's a, you know, it was, it's a model. It says, listen, this is, and this could be a TV show. Like, this is what, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, well, not, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Yeah, right. Right. But not. this is like, this is what you say you wanted. This right. is what you said. You said if we conducted ourselves according to the standard, we would be accepted into this country. And what happened? Half the opposition party said that man is not an American. Mm -hmm. He's not a legitimate president. Right. And that woman is not actually a woman. Right. And they made postcards of her looking like an ape. Mm -hmm. And they mocked the family and they made postcards of them with watermelon patches on the White House lawn. And to me, like, I, I, again, I don't really ascribe to that standard, but to me, the great power in it is it exposes the rank hypocrisy. They don't dislike you. <laughs> because you don't accord to right. their values, they dislike you because of who you are. Mm -hmm. And there's no kind of behavior. There's no way you could conduct yourself. They don't care about your dog named Bo. <laughs> I mean, they really don't. There literally are studies about this, man, where people would see the dog. They, they did this, I swear to God, it was an experiment. You can Google this. They showed people the dog, and when people found out it was Obama's dog, they had a lower opinion of the dog. <laughs> I mean, this happened. It sounds like, no, I'm serious. Yo, Google it. This happened. Yes. This is a very, very real thing. And I think the scientists, I think, I think it's Michael Tesla who did the studies. Um, 
But it's a very, very real thing. Mm -hmm. They don't care about your dog. They don't care about, they hate you, man. They hate you. And like, I think until you can really grapple with that, with that, you know, deep seated hatred, you know, that they would have, you know, a, a man like that. And it would be acceptable to refer to him as a food stand president. Like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's as acceptable, you know, when he's giving an address before Congress to, you know, yell out, you lie. That's fine. That's okay. That's okay. There's no way you can conduct yourself to stop them from doing it. They hate you. They hate you. They don't, you know, hate you because, you know, you don't dress a certain way or you ain't doing this. You ain't, they hate you. Who oh, you no, are. There was that tan suit. You said what? There was that tan suit. The tan suit, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Could get rid of the tan suit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Um, so let me move on a little bit. Uh, is it fair to think about the case for reparations as, as the essay that made you famous? Uh, well, I hate it when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said it that way. Oh. Not that you wanted to be, I'm not saying that you wanted to be famous or that, you know, that this is the reason for doing it, but that it sort of took things to a different level. Well, what would I say? Um, what would I say? Uh, I, I would say that was an essay that caused more people to pay attention to the work I was doing and recognize, and recognize my name. That, that's what I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Right. I'm, I'm not comfortable so, with that. And I'm not trying to, you know, criticize yeah. you or anything like that. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it because um, that, that essay is about Mr. Clyde Ross, you know, and it's about his life, you know, and you, mm -hmm. you know, it, it feels kind of grotesque to sit, to have sat at the table of, you know, a 92 year old black man um, who tells you about how he was robbed in Mississippi. Mm -hmm came to the west side of Chicago, got robbed again on the west side of Chicago, and people, you know, looked him in the face and acted like he hadn't been robbed. And people trust you with their stories and you talk about how it made you famous. I mean, it just feels a little. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. And I think, and, and maybe made you famous is the wrong way to put it, mm -hmm. right? I think you said it quite well. It, it's the, the essay where people started paying more attention right. to you or different right. attention. Um, what could you talk a little bit about the writing of that piece? Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, no, it was an exciting piece to write because I started writing it really in. Shoot, OK, was it? So it came out in 14. I started writing that. I really started. I sent the pitch in. I wrote a piece called um, um, Fear of a Black President. And that, that actually did well. I mean, that, that won a national magazine award, which I never thought, and that actually did mean something to me because I was a magazine writer and it was within my trade. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that, meant, that meant a lot to me. And I, I remember thinking, I think this is it. I don't think I can do better than this. I think I've tapped <laughs> out as good as it gets. Um, and I had you know, been doing quite a bit of reading uh, you know, around housing, actually. And for some reason, I, I started reconsidering this concept of reparations. I know what it was. What became quickly apparent to me in a reading was that virtually everything that people think of as quote unquote wrong uh, with black people has nothing to do with black people and has to do with a long history of taking things from black people. Mm -hmm. That became quickly, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. obvious, you know. Um, I said, if, you, if like if an alien came to earth and you asked the alien, can you explain, you know, what happened here? and you gave the alien access to the history, you know, the alien would say, well, you put a group of people in a place and you spend 400 years taking things from them. You know, they might have a variety of problems after that. That's a thing that could happen. Right. So that was clear. So at that point, you know, like reparations became, you know, really clear to me. And I sent it to my editor, uh, Scott Stossel, and he wrote me, actually called me and he said, you know, when I first got this, I thought this was crazy. But then I read through it and I thought you might have something here. Um, and the innovation for me was to not make the case based on slavery, to have slavery in there. But I thought there was no reason why I couldn't pin it on actually actual living mm -hmm. African Americans. Mm -hmm. and I started thinking about housing, you know, and doing quite a bit of reading on housing. And so that was 2012. I probably spent from 2012 until about spring of 2013 just reading. 
And then in 13, I started reporting. And I think I had a draft sort of by the end of you know, 13. And then it didn't, didn't come out to it till 14. Now, the thing that's beautiful about that to me is the whole time, it was like I had this secret. You know, it was like a secret that I had, that I knew it was like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I knew, you know, I, I didn't know, you know, how many people were gonna recognize it, but I knew that it was a really, really good secret. You know, that I knew something mm -hmm. about the world, or I had a, a way of framing the world that was not out there. Now, reparations had obviously been out there, been out there, you know, for years, but pulling it together, using the tools of journalism to do it, you know, as opposed to a kind of abstract, you know, theorizing about reparations. To, to be able to say, that guy right there, pay him. He's still alive. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that was like tremendously, tremendously exciting. And I love that period before a piece comes out because it's the only time when I actually own the thing. Once it comes out, it belongs to you. It's not mine anymore. You know what I mean? That's just, you know, the way it is. And people interpret it and they, you know, go back and forth about it. You know, but it was, um, it was thrilling. And also because there was just no expectation. Like that anything like that was, was going to happen. Now people like they expect things. <laughs> you know, this is a little different. Um, speak, talking about um, other people's assessments of your work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, now you have people talking about your work, but also talking about you. Right. Um, are they, what are the sort of accuracies and inaccuracies or the things that really just... Mm -hmm get under your skin? Or does it? Can you just kind of blow it off and keep it moving? Um, I'll say this, you know, after Between the World, and, like, so I've been writing since 2017. I have been writing for 21 years. Case of Reparations came out in 2014. I had been writing for 18 years by then. Between the World and Me came out, I've been writing for 19 years. Um, so this period of my life is actually a very small period of my career. Mm -hmm. um, when Between the World and Me came out, I, I had to make a, a severe adjustment um, in terms of, because what happened before was, you know, like I would get into discussions about things I had written before and have back and forth, and then it'd be like, all right, whatever. But it was so much. Do you know what I mean? Like the signal was like, and I didn't expect that. Like, everybody had an opinion. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, wow. You know what I mean? And I, I, just, I just didn't, you have to understand, like, everything I do, when I'm doing it, I'm thinking, I just, I got to make this work. You know what I mean? I'm not really thinking about, okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I got to make this work. And I didn't realize what Between the World and Me was going to be. You know, I didn't realize the attention that, you know, it was going to draw. And... Like, I had to get rid of my Facebook. Mm -hmm. I go check on Facebook. You know, you check on Facebook, like, killing time. And it'd be me. Like, somebody would be talking about me in my Facebook feed. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, I thought we were friends. <laughs> like, talking shit about me. I'd be like, damn, I thought, I thought that was my boy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yo, that happened a few times, you know? And um, I did things with people who I, you know, who were friends, who are not friends now. And I found out, you know, people who I thought were friends were not friends. I mean, it's a thing to, like, find out over Twitter that somebody ain't your friend. I don't mean, like, a Twitter friend. I mean an actual friend. <laughs> like, somebody who you know, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you find out they ain't your friend, you know? Uh, and they announce it. Like, they're loud about it. <laughs> so um, what I had to do was adjust. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And um, I... I'm just realizing this now as I'm talking to you, I probably lost something, you know what I mean? Like you go, it's like, you know, when you're young and you're coming up and you're a child and you're, you know, happy, go lucky, curious, jolly about the world. And then if you like me, you grow up in West Baltimore, somebody punches you in the face one day. That happens, that happened to everybody I knew, you know what I mean? And it kills something in you when that happens. There's a part of you that just, it just disappears, you know what I mean? It goes away or it's buried or something. And that's kind of what happened with Between the World and Me. You know what I mean? There was an um, a openness that I had about the world, a curiosity, um, a willingness to engage with people that just, you know, I really had to part with. Um, 
I'm sorry about that because I think a great deal of the power of my work actually came from that, that openness. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, how, you know what the work is going to look like with that gone now. You know, but um, I, I, um, I don't really have the ability to consider outside criticism anymore. You know, some of it is made in good faith, some of it is made in bad faith, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I have to be me. Like, I got to write. You know what I mean? I got to write, you know, as, as, as I do. I can't, um, I, I can't shrink myself and try to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so as a black public intellectual, um, how do you avoid being what Adolph Reed calls an interpreter of the opaquely black heart of darkness for mm. whites? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't like the label black public intellectual. I mean, I know I get that, and that's fine. I don't like that either. I, you know, I always have, because what I do is I, I write. That's, that's the thing I actually do. You know, I'm a journalist. I go out and I report. That's, what I, that's the thing I, I, I actually do. You know, um, I think it's important to interrogate that. You know, I think, you know, Adolf Reed was making a, you know, an important critique. Uh, especially in the sense of not, and I actually think this is true whether the audience is black or white. Um, you, 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 you need, like the writing has to be internal. You have to be satisfying your own curiosities. You can't be performing for folks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can't be thinking about what they want to hear and, what they, and then going out and hey, you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't do that. At the same time, and I've said this, and I think I said it in the book, Adolf Reed didn't publish that in, in the Chicago Defender or the Amsterdam News. <laughs> He published in the Village Voice. Mm -hmm. He was interpreting for white people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just that's just the fact. You know what I mean? And um, any writer that aspires to be read by a wider audience, um, and that's most black writers. I have yet to see a black writer come up to me and say, "I actually don't want a." You know what I mean? I want the smallest audience possible. <laughs> They are by default aspiring to interpret for white people. Mm -hmm. They are, I mean, you gotta be really, really clear about that. I mean, people say that, ah, you just interpret it for white people, but that's what you wanna do. That's what you necessarily want to do. Now, that might not be your guiding impulse. That might not be the thing that, you know, you're th I'm not, you know, saying when folks think that, you know, sit down, ha ha, I'm gonna interpret for white people. But the very, listen, it's, we are a minority in this country, and thus necessarily we are the minority of the people reading in this country. And so there's really no way of getting away from that if you aspire. I mean, people say that you know, about hip hop all the time, when most of the people buying hip hop is white. Well, what do you expect to happen? <laughs> I mean, what, like, what, what is supposed to happen here? Do you really want only black people to, you know, to, 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 to uh, you know, purchase the music, to purchase the books? I think it's much more important to think about your intent. You know, to make sure you're speaking your truths as, as you speak them. But um, th there is no space in which you are only interpreting, you know, uh, uh, for black people. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's worth thinking about as a humbling, you know, sort of measure to keep yourself in check. But as an accurate description of what writing is, um, you know, I, I don't know how true it is. Okay. Um, so I'm going to combine two things here. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones recently tweeted, in truth, most folks who are looking for ta Coates to give them hope are actually looking for them to give him absolution. Mm. Related to that, you asked the question uh, in We Were Eight Years in Power, uh, why do white people like what I write? Mm -hmm. Have you been able to? Yeah, I think I'm pretty clear on that. Okay. I think I was probably clear, like as I was writing, like I think I was deciding myself in prior sets. I mean, listen, if you, um, yes, Nicole is right. People do want absolution, you know, but they don't actually want absolution. They think they want absolution and they don't, you know. I, you know, I was in, um, I spent the year living in France, right? Um, and I, and I, loved, I loved the culture of the country. Um, I did not always love the politics of the country. Um, but that's possible. You know, I love the culture of the South. I obviously don't very often like the politics of the South. Um, and one of the things I loved is they have no ethic that says the customer is right. That just, that don't exist in France. You came into my restaurant, I'm right. 
<laughs> if you were right, you would own a restaurant. <laughs> You'd be cooking. You understand? Like you came into my place to purchase something. Clearly, I know more than you. You know what I mean? I sat down at a cafe one time and I ordered, I know there's two champagnes, and I ordered a glass of uh, the champagne for my wife and me. And the dude looked at me and said, You don't want that one. He said, You want this one? I said, okay, well, that must be what I want. You know what I mean? Because you run, it's your shop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's the same thing as, as, as a right. People think they want <laughs> apps. They steady read you. Why didn't he give me any hope? But you don't stop reading. <laughs> <laughs> like you're steady, so it must be that there's something you know that 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 you're getting. She's correct in the sense that what they are asking for is absolution, but what they want, what they actually want is truth. That's what they want, which I actually believe on some level we all want. We don't want to be lied to. Now we don't have to agree with the people talking to us. We don't have to feel like you know what I mean. It was the answer that we would have gave, but we don't want to be lied to. And um, I think. Um, in that sense, you know, white readers are no less different than, than black readers. You know, mm -hmm. I think as much as folks spend time engaging themselves in the myth, burying themselves in the dream, somewhere in the back of their head, they know it's a lie. They, they know it. You know what I mean? I've been thinking a lot about um, this string of, of dudes um, who are being tossed out of the industry, right, rightfully so, of various industries, you know, after, you know, sexual harassment, you know, accusations or um, some cases sexual assault, rape, etc. And like it's telling a friend about how like it's like shamed me as a man, right? And I was thinking, well, why would that be, right? I've never done anything. What would I have to be ashamed of? And as I thought about it, what shames you is you understand that those accusations are not disconnected from all of the privileges you enjoy. You see, it's actually it's connected. Right. Now, that might be the most extreme <laughs> aspect of it, but right. it's also it's part of like why like um like I can you know when I was younger get drunk and fall asleep on the subway on the way home and not worry about anything happening to me. Or maybe I should have been worried, but not worried in the way that, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Like, it's a different kind of worry, you right. know what I mean? It's a very, very different kind of worry than I probably should have had, than, you know what I mean, say my wife, you know, my, my partner at that time would have had. You're connected to it. You, you, you see, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're not doing the most extreme thing, you are enjoying it. And as shameful as it's been to watch this, you know, it's also been, like, really pleasing to see it. You know what I mean? It really has. And I think, you know, like, when you're, white and somewhat conscious, you know, it's the same sort of thing. It might be, you read this and you're like, oh, you know, you almost want to look away, but at the same time, you, 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 you can't, you know? Okay. Um, you talk about the price of a black president. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think Barack Obama's pres presidency cost black America or America at large? I don't think a presidency cost us much of anything. Mm -hmm. I think white racism and white supremacy cost us a lot. Right. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> Barack ain't do nothing wrong. I mean, he <laughs> ran for president. Right. You know, being himself, being a, you know, a human being. And this crazy ass country responded a certain way. And the way they responded was to, you know, elect a dude who refers to his own daughter as a piece of ass, his words, I'm gonna be real clear, his words, who brags about sexual harassment, court bragged about sexual harassment on tape, this is fine, <laughs> this is okay, he should be president. That, that's the, the, the reaction, that's not Barack's fault, the country's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm sorry, I have to say it, you know, in, in this way, you know, people who believe they are white, who, you know, being white is right, they're crazy. I mean, it's, it's absolute, and I, and I mean that. If you look at across the board, and I did this in the essay I did, virtually every category of white people in this country, the majority voted for Trump. The majority voted for this. Majority of women, majority of men, majority of poor white people, majority of middle class white people, working class white people, rich white people, <laughs> white people that went to college, white people that dropped out of college. <laughs> 
white people that only had high school across the board. Now it varies in terms of right. you know how what you know how big the margin was, but in every case, the majority did that. You cannot convince me that somebody could be black and be that politically unqualified mm -hmm. and even be a governor. <laughs> I mean, forget. Forget president. You know, Donald Trump was black. I mean, he wouldn't have made it off the block. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can't, you can't be that way. You just can't, you can't, right. you can't, you can't be that way and be black. You know, in, in America, you just can't. I mean, jails are full of black people trying to be that way. You know, in the graveyards. And so, um, but the country decided he should have a nuclear code. <laughs> That's a good idea. You know, the majority of white people in this country in every socioeconomic sector thought, yes, give him the nuclear codes. That's insanity. And Barack ain't do that. They did that. Thank you. So in, in this post-Obama era, how has writing about race changed and how, if at all, has your, do you think your role as a journalist has changed? I don't think it has. I still do the same thing, man. I really do, and I expect to continue doing the same thing. I love doing the work I do. Um, I'm excited that, you know, I'm charged, that, you know, gets me amped. I was working on something at the hotel, you know, today. I, I still had the same level of excitement. Mm -hmm. um, I am just happy to have the tools to go out and fight. I feel tremendously, tremendously privileged to, you know, be in the fight, to be a part of this. It's a um, tremendous, tremendous experience. Thank you. Um, we have eight seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do now is we are going to take three questions. I just want you to know that I just follow instructions, so <laughs> don't blame the messenger. Um, we have graduate students in the audience with microphones. And what I'm going to ask is that you ask a question and not provide commentary, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, John, there's a young man up here. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Quinley Stevens. I go to Constitution High School. Um, um, I, I'm really passionate about starting a pro-black like group at my school, but I feel like people are starting to care less about what's going on. I want to like find ways to protest, but people are like, "There's no way you can change anything. This is what's going to be." And I feel like, well, one example would be like in 2015 more people were more like, people wanted to make a change. I felt like it was more of a protestful environment with music and everything. Then I feel like as it progressed, people started to care less and started caring more about other situations. So I was wondering like, what do I do in this situation? I don't know, because I'm not at your school, you know? <laughs> and I mean that, you know, I haven't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what's at work. Um, I, I can tell you how I am. I don't, I do the work I do because I can't do anything else. Um, I do the work I do because, you know, I need to be able to, you know, wake up in the morning and look myself, you know, in the face and feel good about myself. Um, so probably the real question is, what do you need to do? You know, like what, what is the thing that's compelling you? Regardless of what everybody else at your school is saying or regardless of what some dude, you know, on the stage is going to tell you to do. You know, it's really, you know, about your own, you know, feeling, which you feel like you absolutely have to do, must do, in order to satisfy your own moral standards. So I would actually throw the question back at you. Oh. Okay. Hello? Yep. Hi, I have um, two questions, sorry. You can ask so one. So first question is, no, are no, you? you can ask one question. Oh, man. Sorry. Pick the best one. Pick the best <laughs> Make one. it count. Okay, I teach African American history here in Philadelphia. Is there a chapter or a chapter set that you might suggest for us to focus on and why? No. <laughs> can I proceed to my other question? Yeah, you can. Okay. <laughs> Are you critical of Obama at all in this book? I will, I will ask you to read the book. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> Where are we with person? Oh, there we are. Uh, Mr. I'll Coates? take another one. Okay. Because that was <laughs> okay. Know, no disrespect, but that no, was no, that's fine. Another. It's your show. Uh, Mr. Coates, I'm hoping that you can uh, expound a little bit on your thought that white people are crazy. Um, <laughs> in particular, I'm interested in your thoughts on institutions of higher learning like the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and what they do to potentially perpetuate white people being crazy. Right. Thank you. <laughs> well, you, you would know, know the answer to the second. <laughs> More than I would. This is—I think it's my first time even at UPenn. Well, no, I came here once before mm -hmm. with Tom Segrue. That's right. I did. Second. I did. This is my second. I have not spent much time here, um, so I, I don't know what specifically UPenn does. Um, as to white people being crazy, I, I think it's um, important to, to delineate something, and I say this over and over again, but it's, it's important because you know we don't want to tumble into our own dream and our own lie. It is not um, the, the fact of the straight hair, it is not the fact of lighter skin, um, it is not any sort of physical anything, any sort of biological, ancestral, genetic, anything, when, when we talk about race that we refer to. Um, in other words, it is not European abstraction that makes, quote unquote, white people, white people, crazy. It is the structures and systems that say having European abstraction somehow means more that makes white people, well, white in the first place, you know, and thus right. crazy. Um, this is a country that, um, it's very sad to recount this. Uh, this. This is a country that, that has its origins and then continued after it, it was founded. Uh, in, in 250 years of, of, of enslavement, okay? Um, this was not like enslavement as a side thing. This was enslavement that made the country actually exist. W what do I mean by that? And I've said this so many times, I'm blue in the face. Um, at the start of the Civil War, the vast majority of multimillionaires in this country, and proponents of multimillionaires, like if you looked at where their money was made, it was in slaveholding. That was where the wealth of the country was. If you wanted the largest region per capita of slaveholders in this country, you went to, to the Mississippi Valley. The four million African Americans, enslaved African Americans in this country, was something on the order of $4 billion, somewhere around $75 billion today. Give you, a, you know, an idea how much money that is. That is you taking, at that period of time, all the railroads, all the nascent factories, all the shipyards, all the banks, all the productive capacity of this country put together and you put it in one single pile. It was not worth more than the four million enslaved black people in this country. After the war was fought, after some 700, 800,000 people died, we did not say to those four million black people, okay, we recognize we were completely wrong to enslave you. Now go and be happy and pursue the American dream. Instead, we followed that with 100 years of the most lethal campaign of domestic terrorism in American history. It's white supremacist violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we literally lynched people for trying to get an education. We lynched people for going to church. We bombed churches. I mean, this is a thing that actually happened. In the 1930s and 40s, when we decided we wanted to create a middle class in this country through housing, and we wanted to create more wealth in this country. We specifically excluded black people in the laws. We decided we wanted to have a social safety net, social security, unemployment insurance. We took steps to exclude black people in the laws. We decided we wanted to have a GI Bill. After folks that were coming home after World War II, we took steps to exclude black people. Now, there's a lot of talk about, and there should be necessarily, about what that does to black people, but more thought should be put into what that does to white people. Because in order to brutalize somebody in that sort of fashion, over a period of centuries, you, you, you see, you have to tell yourself certain things. You have to tell yourself that that person isn't human. And what you can find in this country is the fields of history, 
fields of biology, nascent fields of genetics, anthropology, religion, business, all the sectors of the country, athletics, marshaled to tell people in this country that this man or this woman sitting next to you is less human than you are. That might make you crazy. I mean, that, that you know, it might legitimately, it, you know, it, it is crazy. I just, I keep going back to this. It is crazy to claim to be a defender of the country and not know why the most lethal war in that country's history was actually fought. That's crazy. It's actually dangerous. You see, because you are serving someone who is negotiating with people in North Korea who have nuclear bombs. And you think Twitter is an effective way and name is an effective way to communicate. See, that's craziness. I repeat, no black person could, be, could go that far being that stupid. You just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. The world would stop you. And so it's one of these situations where you, you think it's, a, it's not a privilege, actually. It's ignorance. It's deep-seated ignorance that endangers you and everybody you love and people you don't even love. It's bad. I, you know, I, 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 I try to stress, I have no wish to be white. Do you understand? And I don't mean that in a kind of boastful, you know, prideful, or, or even a, a mocking way at all, because it is a deep-seated ignorance necessarily about the world. When you're black, you have to know. You have to know in order to, like, just live. You got to know. You better know the world. There's no system built, you know what I mean, that will ease you through your, your ignorance. Your ignorance is punished. You can't be like Trump. You just can't. It's not possible to live that way. The world will let you know. That's probably for the better. I would rather live like that. I would just have those who don't live like that come down here with us and live in the same way. Thank you so much for taking our questions, and thank you so much, Professor, for facilitating this conversation. Um, we can all spend a lot of time um, investing our energies into all of the research that you've poured into your books, but um, I have a question about feeling being substantiated, as you mentioned, kind of being metabolized into good writing. Um, I'm a writer, um, and I'm curious about um, something that you talked about earlier with um, being a dream breaker and being one in a long line of dream breakers, uh, in that I am a, um, I'm a child of a mixed race relationship, um, a beautiful one, I think, in its brokenness. Um, but I, uh, I was fed the dreams, you know, and even though uh, the, the way that food is not our body, um, we still, it's the thing that nourishes us, right? And it, in some way we metabolize that and it becomes our body. Um, and I'm just curious about how we knit our bones together um, when the dreams we break are our bones in one sense. And that way we've taken that in and taken that in as we start to, we start to wake up from this experience or we, you know, we take the medicine and feel the pain of, of reading stories like yours um, and these essays that you've collected and seeing um, the way that the black body is broken in the world around us, you know, the, the, the pain of sort of opening to that. Um, how you as a writer would um, maybe give us advice or wisdom in this sort of like unwinding um, and solving the wounds as we're starting to really feel them. I know that maybe seems abstract, but um, does that make sense? <laughs> you look like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't quite understand. So, I'm sorry. I want to put this down. Um, so much of the story that, that we've been told, to your right. point, of the story that I was raised on is in fact this myth, right? right? Um, and it's, it's inextricable from my experience in the world to this point. And so I'm starting to unravel that and learn my own place in it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really hard to do that. And I don't mean that in a whining way. It's just, it can be really agonizing. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any advice or in your own experience, what it is to sit with that feeling yeah. Um, how you how you continue to nourish the work that you do, knowing that part of it is 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 understanding the poison of what you've been fed, and how that's maybe even shaped or or created your your body and the body of work to this point. I don't know. Sense? I let it burn. Mm. I just let it hurt. You know, it hurts, and that's that's a fact. You know, I mean, life is not all apple pie and ice cream. 
It's mostly not apple pie and ice cream, you know? It mostly hurts. Um, I don't, you know, I, I get asked all the time, especially when I'm at colleges, you know, you talk about this and it's so hard. What is your self care? <laughs> I tell my self care is reading and writing, you know? I, I get great, because um, I, I don't, uh, you know, some of it, I guess, comes out of how you, how you came up. You know, I, I came up in this household that was a really, really hard household. But um, it was an incredibly loving household. I, I didn't doubt that I was loved. And then when I went into writing, you know, I, I had this editor who was hard and he would yell and he would, you know, be like, you know, really direct. But I, I didn't doubt that he cared about me. I didn't consider him, you know, uh, abusive. I the people around me, you know, um, my friends, my wife, you know, my, my, my brothers and sisters, they, they're, they're hard people. You know, they're the kind of people to tell me, yo, you shouldn't do that. Like, you might not want to do that. Um, that. That's the world I, I want to live in. You know, I, I, because I think that's what the world actually is. And so I do, you know, I read things, you know, that sometimes are, you know, painful and hard to take. You know, again, you know, you go and you sit in the, somebody's household, you know, and they tell you about how, you know, the, the country ripped them off and it's hard to take. You know, you walk away and, you, you know, you feel a certain kind of a way about that. But the writing is, um, like, I, um, I, I get angry and I get hateful and I get resentful and I experience all the kind of negative emotions that I think human beings had a right to experience. And then I just go write. And I, and, I, and I push it all out, you know what I mean? And I process it and I, you know, turn it, you know, uh, into something. But I don't, um, I don't know, man, I let it burn. <laughs> and then I try to make it burn, you know what I mean? When I sit down to write, you know, that's my only way of dealing with it. Thank you. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, we greatly appreciate having you here and sharing all of this with us. And we look forward to reading everything that you write moving forward. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to thank my staff and the graduate students who wrote this big pile of questions. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Penn Law, SP2, GSE, Annenberg, and uh, I also would like to thank the Office of the President and the Office of the Provost, all of whom helped make this possible. Uh, thank you again for coming and have a good evening. Thank you.